global warming, water pollution, depletion of resources. There have been repeated warnings that the earth we live on is in a state of risk. Nevertheless, in our pursuit of a more affluent life, we have been relentlessly consuming global resources. And our rate of consumption is constantly accelerating. On August the 8th, 2016, the United Nations Environment Programme announced a survey report. Today is a troubling date. According to the Global Footprint Network, humanity has already used up all of the renewable natural resources that the planet can replenish this year. Will we humans continue chasing after economic development as we do now and devour nature? The Blue Planet Prize, established in Japan in 1992, is regarded as the Nobel Prize in the field of environmental issues. Every year, two major contributors to the solving of global environmental problems are selected as winners. They each receive a certificate of merit, a trophy representing the harmony of humanity and the environment, and 50 million yen. One of the 2016 laureates was Mr. Pavan Sukhdev, an environmental economist. The other was the zoologist, Professor Marcus Borner. Their efforts have been focused on achieving both economic development and environmental conservation. In what ways have they been trying to realize that aim? I want you to guess, how old is this suit? 10 years. 10 years. No, 40 years. Ah. Oh, this is my father's suit, actually. It works. Yeah. This is sustainability. What should we be doing for the sake of maintaining a sustainable society? We would like to discover solutions from the two Blue Planet Prize laureates. One of Pavan Sukhdev's bases is in Switzerland. In mid-July, one month after our initial request, he could at last find time in his busy schedule for a substantial interview. On Monday this week, I was in Portugal, in Lisbon. Then the same evening, I, went, I flew to London because the next day was the Accounting for Sustainability Summit. It's Thursday, I had meetings uh, with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on the work they are doing in India on circular economy. And uh, in the same evening I came here so that I can meet you now, today. In his book, Corporation 2020, published in 2012, Sukhdev promoted the integration of the values of nature into corporate accounting systems and the creation of a system to protect nature through corporate activities by the year 2020. So, the basic reason why we don't have sustainability, especially environmental sustainability, is because resource use and economic direction is wrong. And to correct this, we need to change the way that the economy works. And to correct the way the economy works, we need to change the way the corporation works. Mr. Pavan Sukhdev, environmental economist. Sukhdev was born in New Delhi, India in 1960. His strict father, who was a policeman, had a strong influence on him. My father taught me some very important moral lessons early in life, uh, especially to do with professional life. Uh, from him I learned that hard work is its own reward. If you get extra, that's great, but actually doing the work well is itself a blessing. That's been my driving uh, philosophy for, for life. From his childhood, he devoted himself to his studies, displaying particular skills in mathematics and English, and studied physics and economics at Oxford University. He joined a bank in 1983 and started a career as a banker. 
He made steady advances, rising to the position of Chief Operating Officer for Deutsche Bank's Asian Global Markets business. At home, he was blessed with two daughters and spent as much time as possible living in harmony with nature. The elder one was passionate about nature and would take me out from our home and I would take pictures of birds and she would always tell me to hurry up and take a picture. I was not a good photographer, but I managed to get some decent pictures and we would collect those pictures in an album. As the successful banker was on the verge of reaching the age of 40, a friend's words drastically changed his life. A friend in Singapore asked me, what is money? Why is some things worth money and other things not worth money? And in answering that question, I realized, my God, we have got the system so badly wrong. Externalities on nature are huge, and we are losing it at a pace which is ridiculous, and we don't seem to care. That's the biggest mistake that mankind is making. So he found a mission to change conventional economic thinking that ignored the values of nature. My inputs as a result of being a father of two young children, the questions that friends had asked me, and my own understanding of economics and what's wrong with it, it all came together. I realized this is my purpose. First, he decided to try grasping the values of nature in his home country of India. How can the values of nature be measured? The answer dawned on Sukhdev when he read a book titled Blueprint for a Green Economy. It explained a methodology about environmental accounting, which means the evaluation of the values of nature in terms of prices and the quantity of materials in order to stop humans excessively using natural resources because they regard them as free. In 2003, he visited the author of the book, Professor David Pierce of London University, who is a leading authority on environmental economics. He took with him his paper on evaluation of the price of nature in India. He was very kind. We discussed the paper and the proposal. And I, I left that meeting encouraged that uh, such a world leader in this space doesn't think the idea is stupid. With the help of friends knowledgeable about accounting and assistance financing, he calculated the values of forests, ecosystems, water and other natural resources that have been lost due to business activities in each state of India. The state of Himachal Pradesh produced about 3.3 billion US dollars of GDP in 2002. But how much value of nature did it lose as a result of its business activities? For example, whenever forests were cut down, the natural biodiversity involving trees, insects and animals was seriously damaged. When the values of various natural resources lost in that way were expressed numerically and accumulated, they discovered there was a loss of nearly 900 million US dollars, so the GDP was reduced to almost 70%. The previously invisible burden being put on nature by the state economy was clarified. Soil formation, creating pollination for crops and so on. These are the functions of the forest. But some of those functions have economic value for humankind. These are called the benefits. Supposing the bees were all lost this year because there were no forests and climate had changed and so on. Then it is estimated that the total value of bee-based pollination to fruit and, and crops around the world is something of the order of 200 billion dollars or 150 billion euros. In recognition of this study, Sukhdev was appointed as the study leader for an international project. The Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, or TEEB, is a study project which was launched in 2007 with the support of the European Commission. By creating a worldwide network, the project undertook a global survey on the values of nature and economic loss which had not been visible before. Through his work, a community has been established and created around TEEB 
from the private sector to the public sector, to the NGOs, to the media. And at an international conference held in Germany in 2008, the project members reported that mankind has lost natural capital of more than $2 trillion per year at a conservative estimate. By a strange coincidence, it was the same year that the world was hit hard by the financial crisis caused by the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. So everyone was very excited about the two to three trillion to five trillion losses that happened in 2008 because of the financial crisis. And I pointed out to them, but excuse me, you have been losing this much natural capital every year for the last few decades. How come you're not excited by that? Right? So I think that was an important point and some people understood the issue because of that. In 2011, Sukhdev decided to put every effort into the quest for global sustainability as an environmental economist and he left the bank he had served for almost 30 years. Basically, what I do the bar at his home in Switzerland is handmade. These are all existing boxes, everything is recycled, so I have to cut very carefully to make sure everything fits. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a, an exercise. Recycling is fashionable. It's yes. not bad, it's good. Yes. As a former banker, Sukhdev was convinced that it was the accounting systems of private companies that held the key to breaking through the situation we had been in up till then. As a banker, I, I, of course, through my experience with accounts, I understood how to read a balance sheet and understand what a company is. Who decides that pattern of resource use? Who decides that economic direction? It is actually the corporation because the private sector is two thirds of the economy and jobs. Would they destroy a factory? Right? No. Why? Because it's got a value. It sits in the balance sheet of some company. But they put no value to this hugely important nature. So when they destroy it, they don't show anything. Invisible. Do what you want, right? Because it's invisible. No, it's highly valuable. It doesn't matter that you can't buy it and you can't sell it. He thought up a form of accounting he called natural capital accounting. This is an example presented by Puma, the footwear and sports goods manufacturer. Its gross sales figure for 2010 was $3.68 billion. In the conventional accounting system, profit is calculated by deducting costs, including manufacturing expenses from this sales figure. Costs for that year amounted to around $3.4 billion and net earnings were around $280 million. But the costs figure ignores the natural capital lost. By clearing forest areas to create farmland, water pollution issues, and carbon dioxide emissions. Natural capital accounting numerically reveals the loss, in other words, the total natural capital cost. In Puma's case, that amounts to around $200 million. If the company included this cost in its accounting, its earnings would be $80 million, less than a third of the reported figure. If you continue manufacturing without realizing the load imposed on nature, nature will eventually become non-renewable, rendering conventional manufacturing impossible. Through the visualization of natural capital costs, companies are able to maintain the natural environment and the balance of corporate production activities by allotting capital to the reduction of CO2 emissions and the conservation of forests and water resources. The idea is spreading that this is the way that enables companies to guarantee their own sustainability. The Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, launched in 2006 with the support of the United Nations, is an initiative to invite investment from companies which are considering the environment and society. Many corporate investors are signatories, including pension funds, the asset management amount of the signatories has increased by nearly 10 times during the last 10 years and has now reached more than $60 trillion. 
例えばその年金資金の話をしても。For example, we have to manage pension funds for 100 years. Long term management is really necessary. And against that background, I think there is a growing trend to highly rate companies that are applying appropriate asset management environment. In 2016, the Natural Capital Protocol was announced to indicate the procedures in an easy to understand manner when companies introduce natural capital accounting. Because the framework created by SUCDEF as the leader has been approved by more than 200 major companies and international organizations, the momentum of incorporating natural capital accounting into corporate decision making is growing. Today, rather than running after only immediate profit, Many companies are switching sharply to a style of management that can achieve both business development and environmental conservation. That all I want to do is to increase GDP. <laughs> Because my point is that you may increase GDP and destroy every piece of natural capital that you've got, and then in a few years you will have no country left. That's not what you want. We want the free people to have the freedom, as, as a friend of mine says.、Um, You want to have the freedom to develop, not the freedom to destroy yourself. The Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, East Africa. There is a scientist who has been working for the past 40 years to preserve a rich ecosystem in this area that is home to more than 3 million wild animals. We have to do a lot if we want to succeed in. Keeping our blue planet blue. Professor Marcus Borner, zoologist. Borner was born in Tauville, Switzerland, in April 1945. It's still part of his daily routine to go out rowing on Lake Zurich on the boat he inherited from his grandfather. Growing up in this town, he spent a lot of time with his grandfather, who knew a lot about nature, and he became a lively boy who loved animals. So I had、uh, all this kind of snakes at home, and an iguana, and、um, my, and of course I put them in self-made ter terrariums, but they were not so good, so they escaped. So I had the snakes in the house, and my mom didn't like that very much. But it was good because it kind of、uh, kept her out of my room. Borna entered the University of Zurich at the age of 19 and studied zoology. However, the outgoing young man found university life very restrictive. I、uh, got the chance to work for World Wildlife Fund International at that time. And、uh, go and do an assessment of the status of the Sumatran rhinoceros. So I also wanted to do something that is not in the laboratory, but that is out in the world and has some real impact on the life of these animals. I'm studying. In 1972, he left Switzerland and travelled to far away Sumatra in Indonesia. There, he conducted research for three years on the situation regarding the Sumatran rhinos, whose numbers were steadily declining. Unusual for that time, he leapt straight into fieldwork. Borna's research activities caught the attention of a famous academic. Dr. Bernhard Jimek. Was the president of the Frankfurt Zoological Society. After the Second World War, he revitalized Germany's dilapidated zoos and often visited Africa to study wildlife. Attracted by Africa's huge open expanses and diversity of wildlife, Jimek produced many nature documentaries on Tanzania. Serengeti shall not die. Released in 1959, won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Triggered by that documentary, Jimek became deeply involved in the management of the Serengeti National Park, 
and assign Borna to be its director. I, as a kid, I uh, watched uh, movies of Professor Jimek, but I wasn't really thinking then that I will ever be working for this man or that I will go to a wild place like the Serengeti. In 1983, Borna began his post in the Serengeti National Park and moved into a house inside the park. What kind of animals lived in the massive park? How many were there? And how did they move around? Borna started observing them from a light aircraft. By collecting information about the park's ecosystems on a seasonal basis, Borna gradually developed a management system. Around those early days, however, Tanzania was in financial trouble due to a conflict with a neighboring country and the Serengeti was facing a major issue. Poaching was one of the biggest problems in the, in the Serengeti at that time. The most dangerous poaching is what we call trophy poaching. That is for the horn of the rhino and for the tusks of the elephants. During the 1980s, rhino horns and elephant tusks were being traded for high prices at black markets in Southeast Asia. Poachers often came with guns in hand and killed wild animals at random. Borna started to arrange park rangers. They were provided with a salary and equipment and given training in order to protect the animals from poachers. In 1991, however, a serious situation arose. When this poaching came through, all rhinos were killed except two in the Serengeti. And we only had two, and there were two females. Borna realized that there was no point in just protecting animals. At the same time, it was essential to consider the people who were involved in park matters or living close to it. We saw more and more that, you know, people in an ecosystem, they're part of an ecosystem. And they're not just the problem in the ecosystem, they're also a solution in the ecosystem. So we are trying, uh, we were starting to try to get people involved in looking after their own wildlife, over their own natural resources. But before that, they had no right on the animals. So if a poacher came from far away and said, I want to go poaching in Serengeti, they say, yeah, Karibisana, welcome. Here you go, because it's not our animal. But if you give them the animal and you say, you the owner, they will say, eh, 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 slowly, eh? I, I need this zebra for my tourists who are coming by and who are paying me to show you this zebra. You know? So there's a, a, a real different thinking about how to uh, work with people in, in conservation that has slowly become, and I think pioneered in the Serengeti. With a desire to protect the Serengeti black rhinos from extinction, Borna tenaciously repeated negotiations with the governments of Tanzania and South Africa, as well as various international organizations. In 2010, he managed to secure an agreement to move more than 30 black rhinos to the park from South Africa. Today, the rhino population has grown to 100. In 2011, a new problem emerged. The government of Tanzania proposed a plan to build a highway right through the northern part of the Serengeti National Park. The idea behind the plan was to revitalize the economy by connecting cities with a highway. However, the highway would block the great annual migration of 1.5 million wildebeest as they search for water during the dry season. It was estimated that trucks would pass along the road roughly every two minutes. A fence would have to be constructed along the highway to avoid the danger of collision with the animals. The most important species is, is, is the, the wildebeest because there are so many. 
and where they are, there is enough dung to uh, fertilize the ground. Where they go through, they have cut down the grass so there is no fire. Uh, a key species, like the wildebeest, is having obvious kind of links to everywhere. The government of Tanzania had planned the highway to create a foundation for economic growth. The road was needed for transporting agricultural products to market and improving access to schools and hospitals. So Borna went beyond the limits of his role as a zoologist and groped to find a highway route which would produce higher economic effects and could be built without disturbing the integrity of the Serengeti National Park. He compared the positive economic effects of three possible routes, including the one put forward by the government. After carrying out repeated surveys, by mapping the densely populated areas and more flourishing agricultural districts, he finally suggested a route passing round the southern part of the park. By demonstrating the economic advantages of this route, he persuaded the government to revise its highway plan. We really opened the doors to work with the communities, to work with the politicians, to work with the scientists, to work with the conservation organization. Only if you get everybody together are you successful. And that sometimes is a very long way and a very difficult way. But for me it's the only way. You have to work together if you want to achieve something. Although Professor Borna left his position in 2012, he has started to train local young people who are striving to preserve Tanzania's natural heritage. The Blue Planet Prize recognizes major contributions to the solution of global environmental issues. The 2016 winners were environmental economist Pavan Subdev and zoologist Marcus Borna. We are moving too fast towards climate catastrophe, towards freshwater catastrophes. I have two daughters and I want to make sure that they can enjoy the benefits of nature as much as I did or my parents did. And indeed that their children and their children's children can continue to enjoy the value that nature provides to humanity. Uh, national parks uh, with strict protection are a yardstick so we can measure what it is that is changing in the world. And maybe more important one for me is that we as human beings actually need these wild places. Part of us and part of our soul wants to be in these wild places. The mutual aim of the invaluable services rendered in their respective ways by the two laureates is to protect our blue planet so that humanity and nature can coexist in harmony forever. This program was made possible by the Asahi Glass Foundation. この鏡に映ると猫の国への道が現れるのです。でも前来た時はそんなの見えなかったよ。それはあなたたちがまだ未熟だったから。さあ、覗いて。ティアランが光っ